woman that is anointed and appointed for such a time as this. She was active in the medical profession when the Lord released her from healing and ministering to physical disorders that she might become a midwife in the kingdom and usher us through the throes of labor and place us in the birth position that we might be ready to push forth everything that God put on us. I want you to stand to your feet and receive this mighty war horse, this woman of God, as she comes all the way from Brooklyn, New York, Evangelist Jackie McCullough. Come on, make a welcome. Come on and make a welcome. Praise the Lord. Before you take your seats, just turn around and tell your neighbor, I'm so glad we're in Azusa together. You may be seated in Jesus' name. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. I'm just glad that I'm here tonight to worship with you, to fellowship, to give honor to God, and of course, to the man and the woman of God, the visionary of this great movement, this particular gathering all over the country that has moved, changed, challenged, motivated people far and wide. This is my first time greeting Pastor Carlton Pearson, and it's truly a privilege to be in his presence. To all of the ministers, to the pastors, to Bishop Jakes, to my dear friend, Dr. Showell, and of course, special greeting to my mom and dad who have been preaching for 57 years. I'm just glad to be here with you at Azusa 94. I thank God for being a Christian. How about you? I know that term is being used very loosely, it means, it could mean I don't smoke cigarette, I don't drink beer, I don't fornicate, I don't, I don't commit adultery, but that's morality. I'm not talking about morality. It could mean that I sing on the choir and that my mom bought the first pew in the church and that my dad is the pastor, but that's church membership. It could mean that I'm very diligent in service, I'm very skilled, I'm one of the high-tech new 20th century appointee to the board of trustee, I know how to reduce this Christian walk to a science, I know how to make Christian ministries marketable, I'm not talking about marketing, I'm talking about having a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm just glad that he is Lord of my life. It could mean you walked down the altar several years ago and got saved and then got up and sat down and lived your life the way you wanted to and just saluted him every now and then. And on Sunday morning, you come in and wave your little hand and do your little dance. And when you walk out the door, you dismiss him. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about that I'm glad that I'm submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. How about you? Oh, you're not going to shout on that one, but I'm going to holler on that one. For he is Lord. He has risen from the dead and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And the word Lord means he is boss. He calls the shots. He's in charge. He rules and super rules. He has the last word. Well, I know when you come to places like these, you really need one of those pepped up, hyped up, you know, messages perhaps to kind of get you over the moment and get you back to the humdrum tedium of your day-to-day -day living. But Sister Yolanda ha Adams in her first song really put her finger on the pulse of the message. I was wrestling between two messages, but she talked about bringing your heart, preparing your heart for the Lord. And I have a message to the heart of the nation, a message to the heart of the world of Christendom, a message to the heart of every person sitting 
in every seat tonight, a message to the heart. First Samuel, the seventh chapter, beginning at verse one and ending at verse four. First Samuel chapter seven, beginning at verse one and ending at verse four. In the Old Testament, the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 7, beginning at verse 1 and ending at verse 4, a message to the heart. Here beginneth the reading of God's holy word. And the men of at Jerium came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought them into the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eliezer his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass while the ark abode in Kirj at Jerim, that the time was long for it was 20 years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel saying, if ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you. And prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and serve the Lord only. So far the scripture. This book of the Old Testament, according to the scholars, was really originally one book. But as they decided to canonize the Bible or to bring certain books that are acceptable, what we call the revelation of the will of God from Genesis to Revelation, they broke it down into 1st and 2nd Samuel. The books of Samuel and Kings are really called the books of kingdoms where it talks about the reign of kings the kingdoms of certain kings the purpose the activities of these kingdoms but the purpose of these old testament historical books really comes to give us instructions as the bible says in romans 15 and 4 for whatsoever things were written aforetime for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope these, these historical events, these chronicles are written so that we can have warnings, instructions, encouragement, how to serve God and to love him better. Tell somebody I want to love him better. More specifically, this particular book focuses on the activities of a very outstanding man by the name of Samuel. He had a very, very powerful administration. He ruled as judge and prophet. He also brought in two kingship. He also brought in Saul and David. He brought in the first two kings of the kings of Israel. This particular book tells us of a time period when the spiritual leadership was in trouble. And if there's anything that we are suffering from as a church with all the fantastic churches with all the wonderful carpets and pews, there's a dearth in the land for clear, profound, decisive spiritual leadership. And the spiritual leadership was high that even though Eli could reproduce himself in Samuel, he could not discipline his two sons. He allowed Ophni and Fahinas to do anything they wanted to do and then go in the temple and officiate. And when people look at sloppy leadership, they live sloppy lives. So here, discouragement had taken hold of the nation of Israel. The people's hearts were weak. Fahinas went in and Hophni went in and they messed with the sacredness of the offerings and the altars. They committed fornication in front of the temple doors and the people's hearts failed them. They were also seduced by the worship of other gods. They were in the midst of the land and they watched other people worship their gods and these gods or the worship of these gods entailed 
perverted sexual expression. The main theme of these, this worship was sexual perversion and also indulging in materialism. And it attracted the minds of the people. And because the leadership was not clear, they were easily seduced away into strange worship. At this particular time, the, the, the Bible says that the Philistines, who were the seafaring people, were now coming inland. They wanted land. They wanted property. And so they became a constant threat to the nation of Israel. And when the spiritual tide is low, it affects the economy. It affects us politically. And therefore, they were ripe and ready to be overtaken and oppressed by the Philistines. The Bible says that Israel decided to fight against the Philistines. We will go up and fight against them to preserve the land. But they lacked the power, the initiative, because they had become a beaten people spiritually. And the Bible said that the Philistines came and 4,000 men died. And they had the nerve to turn around and say to the Lord, why did you allow the Philistines to attack us? Why did you allow them to whip us? And then they backed up and says, well, maybe if we just get God to give us a little favor, it's called being churchy. It's called knowing how to manipulate your religiosity to get God to work for you. In the world, it's called magic. Somebody say magic. And that's all we try to do in Pentecost now is play magic. Oh, we know how to fast and we know how to wave our hands and we know how to use a churchy jerk because we think this thing is magic. Tell somebody it ain't magic, honey. Either it's God or it's not God. So they decided that since we are in trouble as a nation, we're in trouble as a people, we went up to defend ourselves and to protect our land. And trust me, the bottom line is always economics, property, money, gold, silver. And because part of the promise has to do with land, the children of Israel knew that if their land were taken, the promise would be taken. So they fought to protect their promise. But they lost because you can't have the promise without the promise giver. And we try to play that game. We want him when we need something. When we get him, we want to forget him. And the Bible said they decided to play this little churchy today, churchy games. Try to bend God's hand. Try to use magic. Try to use rituals. Try to use liturgics. Even though we're doing it, our hearts are far from him. But we know if we wave our hand a little bit, we'll get his attention. We try to barack and to heal her. We try to do all the things that we know that he inhabits the praises of his people. Oh, even though we know we ain't going to live right after we leave here. But we try to get his attention. And so they decided to get God's attention. Let's send to Shiloh where the Ark of the Covenant is. And let's bring it in the midst of our camp. For if the Ark of the Covenant is in the midst of our camp, then we know that God will save us. Oh, they knew how to talk it well. They knew how to say it well. The Ark of the Covenant was not God. It was a symbol of God's presence. It was a symbol of the imminent presence of God. That God is with us. He's here. He's, he's omnipresent. He's here, there, and everywhere. We can't contain him in a box. We can't contain him in a temple. We can't contain him in the universe. He's too high, you can't get over him. He's too low, you can't get under him. He's too wide, you can't get around him. But we can get close to him. I tell somebody I just want to get close to him. I, I can't get over him. I can't get around him. But I can get close to him. They understood that if they got close to God. They would have safety. Protection from the enemy. The Ark of the Covenant was an oblong box. Made out of shitting wood overlaid with gold. Inside of the Ark of the Covenant you had Aaron's rod that budded to show that God can take a no good for nothing man and make him somebody. And then you had the tablets of the law to show that God says thou shalt and thou shalt not. Then you had the pottage of manna to show that God can make a way out of no way. His name is still Jehovah Jireh. 
and then you had the lid and on top of the lid it was sealed and then you had the mercy seat where you sprinkled the blood to show that without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin and right over the mercy seat you had the cherubim's win- wings who were tipped together and at the tipped wings you had the Shekinah known as the glory cloud which represent that God is here he is very much here he is close to us if we get close to him and in his presence we will feel the nearness of his presence and the nearness of his touch and they understood that when the ark was in the midst they were secure go up and get the ark go up and let God think that we want him with us As a matter of fact, we want him with us, but we only want him with us because we want to whip the Philistines. And we only want him to whip the Philistines because we want to keep our land. Oh, come on, it's very logical. They only wanted God for their own purpose. Mr. Santa Claus, I I want you to do what I want you to do. And, And when I press a button, I want you to move when you get ready. It's called church magic. Ah, but I came to set the church in order today. There ain't no magic. God is God all by himself. The Bible said they brought the ark seeking the favor of God. And they were going to do it through the methods that they knew how. And when they brought the ark of God, look at it. The Bible said, you can read it in the text. When they brought the ark, there was a great shout. And the Hebrew word meant a great screaming, almost a shrilling shout. A shout, a sound that they used when they were going into war. And it was so powerful. The the, the description of of the noise is that it almost broke the eardrum. They got together and screamed because they understood that they recognized that God, the presence of God, the nearness of God, the protection of God was coming in their midst. When the Philistines heard the shout, they understood it. So the devil understands your praise. He understands when you praise God what you're saying. You may not understand it. You might be just doing it out of form or fashion. But he knows that when you say hallelujah and glory to God, that there's something going on between heaven and earth. He knows that when you wave your hand and praise God, that God comes in the midst of his people. He understands that when you get loud and make a joyful noise unto the Lord, that something is going to happen. His kingdom is going to be affected and things will be changed. Oh, the devil is afraid of praise. He knows as long as you sit and look cute and cross your leg, ain't nothing going to happen. But the moment you raise your hand and open your mouth, he is in trouble. The noise disturb the Philistines for the Bible said they made the statement God is in the midst of his people that's why you got to make noise whether you're real or not you got to make noise let everything that have breath praise the Lord whether you're going to live right or not that's all right maybe if you make enough noise your mind will be changed but you got to praise him you got to open your mouth and praise him ah you got to bless him with all your heart You got to open your mouth and lift up your voice like a trumpet and let everybody know that there is a God and that he rules in the affairs of men and that he's high and lifted up and that he's king of kings and lord of lords. Oh, I wish I had a people that love him. Put your hands together. Oh, yes, and praise him. He is worthy to be praised from the rising of the sun to the going down of the sun. They made the noise. The Philistines understood the noise and the Bible said they concluded and listened to this powerful conclusion. That's why you can't worship in ignorance. That's why you must understand why you worship because the devil comes after you with intelligence. Listen to this intelligent, logical conclusion. If they worship God, if they're screaming like that, then God must be in the camp. And if God is in the camp, then we can't conquer them. If God is in the midst, then we can't whip them. If God is with them, then we can't overtake them. So the thing that we must do is take the presence of God out of the camp. And then we'll be able to subdue them. And the devil knows exactly how to get God out of your program. If you don't believe it, check out some of our churches on Sunday morning. It's our program. He is not on the program. He's not even in the church.
the Bible said that they organized and they confiscated the Ark of the Covenant. And they took the Ark of the Covenant and brought it to Ashdod. And the Bible said they put it in the house of Dagon. Dagon was their God made out of part fish and part man. When they got up the next morning, Dagon was on his face before the presence of God. They put Dagon back up. And when they woke up the next morning, not only was Dagon on his face, but he lost his head and his hands. Because ain't no God like our God. He is the only God. Now unto the king eternal, immortal invisible the only wise God oh forever and ever and ever and ever or oh, you might be serving somebody else but I know in whom I believe you might be confusing here but I know who the real God is he is the God of gods he is the king of kings he is the mighty God he is the everlasting father and his name is not Allah and his name is not Buddha oh but he is the king of kings come on and let me hear your praises The Bible said that finally the Philistines got the message. We are not capable to handle the presence of the Lord. We cannot entertain his presence. We do not have the ability to endure his presence. For when you worship another God, you can't stand to be that close to the presence of God. It is conflict of interest. Oh, you can't deal with the pressure. Either you love him or you hate him. Either you'll say yes to him or you'll say no to him. Either you'll go with him or you'll run away from him. And the Philistines said we can't handle him and we don't want his presence. And the world does not want the presence of the Lord. And the world does not want the presence of the church. And your family who are not saved don't want you to talk about Jesus. Oh, but I'm here to tell the church we better come on back so that the presence of the Lord can be exalted so that the name of the Lord can ring in our homes oh we're intimidated and we want God out of the picture but we better bring him back in the picture we better bring our hearts back to the Lord come on and let me hear you say glory, glory. the Bible said that they try to get rid of the presence of the Lord and in some biblical typology they say the Philistines represents the flesh and the flesh does not want the spirit the Bible says that the spirit and the flesh wars together. So flesh does not want God to be in the midst. Does not want God to rule and to super rule. Does not want the presence of God to influence, to guide, to move, to do his thing. The flesh wants to take preeminence over the presence of the Lord. So the Philistines realize we can't handle it. And the flesh, the flesh, the flesh, the flesh competes. But after a while, the flesh knows that God is going to have his way. Get him out of our midst. Get him away from, get the ark away from here rather. Move it out of here. And the Bible said they put it on a milk kind, a, a, a cow that was giving suck. And the Bible said that they put it on the back to send it back to the camp of the Israelites. And they says, well, if this is God, then this, this, this cow will take it straight to the camp. If it's not God, then that cow will go find the babe that, he's, that she's giving suck to and go astray. But if it's God, they'll take it right back into the camp of the Israelites. And the Bible said that the cow hung its head and took it straight into the camp at Beth Shemeth. And when the the Levites saw the Ark of the Covenant coming. They recognized the presence of God is coming. Coming from the land of the Philistines. Oh, the devil doesn't want the presence of God. The world doesn't want the presence of God. But the question is, does the church want the presence of God? And the Bible said when the Levites saw the Ark of the Covenant, they came and started inspecting. The Philistines understood. They may be heathen and they may be paganistic, but they understood that they had to pay a transgress offering for offending Israel's God. So they made gold. They made uh, uh, gold images of emeralds and mice, the plagues that, that God had sent upon them. Put them in the coffers around the Ark of the Covenant and sent it back to the camp. The Levites started looking in the coffer. And saw the golden emeralds and the golden mice. Placed the ark on a stone in the field, an unstable place. And then they decided to lift the lid where the blood was sprinkled. Ah, you don't tamper with the things that God has done to cover man's sin. 
And the Bible said that God struck down 4,000 4, or 40,000 70 men. Some scholars say it was only 70 men. But whether 70 or 40,000, God exemplified his anger that you have tampered with the presence of the Lord. You have tampered with the Ark of the Covenant. You have lifted the lid. You have messed with the blood. And the Bible said that men died. And the men of Beth Shemit got angry and upset and frustrated. Ah, they didn't want the presence of God. For you see, we only want God when he gives us good things. But we don't want to deal with God in judgment. We have given you a jive tip, ladies and gentlemen. We have led you down the garden path to make you think that God just sits up there with his head leaned to the side like a sad homosexual and just bow and do what you want him to do. We do not tell you that God is a God of mercy, but he's also a God of judgment. Oh, you all ain't gonna hear me, but I tell you, we have played some dumb games. Oh, the Bible said he's a consuming fire. Every now and then he rides in a storm, proving that he is God. Uh, and that he'll do what he wants in the armies of men. And who can stop him? Put your hands together and let me hear you say hallelujah. The Bible said that they got angry, they got angry, they got disturbed. But when we can't always track God and, and, and we can't always explain everything that he does and we can't control his actions, then we've got to explain the way and erase it. Then we've got to come up with some new theology to get him out the picture or to get the action out the picture. We have to come up with something to cover his tracks as if he needs somebody to cover his tracks. Ah, so they decided let's get rid of the presence. It's too hot. We can't explain, we can't understand why his judgment was so harsh. So move him out of here, move him out of here. Ah, go down to this place called Kerjap Jirim and tell them to come get the ark. We're not even going to touch it anymore. And the Bible said they send up the leaders uh, to come and bring the presence of the Lord. And these guys uh, were happy to get the presence of God. The Bible said they came and fetched the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab. And his name means a giver, a man who loves to give. You see, people who love to give like to hang around God. And the Bible said that this city was located near Judah. People who like to praise like to hang around the presence of God. Givers and praisers love to have God around. Oh, when you praise God, you love to be in his presence. When you love him and love to worship him, you want his presence around. For in the presence of God, there is security. There is guidance. The Bible says in the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. And at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Only folk who are cheap and stingy and full of themselves don't want God. Only the flesh doesn't want God. But when you love him and you love to praise him, you love to get close to him I want the presence of the Lord come and get him and they said we're coming to get him put him in the house of Abinadab and they were prepared to entertain the presence of God the Bible said they got somebody sanctified him he was not from a Levitical order. He was not from the tribe of Levi. He was not a son of Aaron. But he was a man that was worthy. Ah, trouble was everywhere. The leadership was as gone down and deteriorated. So they didn't have anybody really in a certain position to grab, to take care of it. It was a time of crisis. And in a time of crisis, you've got to avoid protocol. Ah, you got to grab folk that just love God. Can't worry about whether they got a license, whether they're ordained, just grab them. You love God come on you're serving God come on you're sanctified come on you live in holy come on come on to the presence of the Lord come on Eliezer you're a holy man <laughs> tell somebody holiness is still right it's still right oh I know we don't want to talk about it in the 20th century but holiness is still right ah, for God is a holy God Oh, come on and help me somebody. He's holy. He's holy. He's holy. He's holy. He's holy. He's holy. And he wants a holy people. Eliezer, we're going to sanctify you. Set you apart. Just to serve the presence of the Lord. Before the presence of the Lord. 
keep the place clean. They put it in a house. The people in Beth Shemesh put it on a stone. So you see, when you don't want the presence of the, God, of the Lord, you are not diligent. You are careless. And today we're careless in our worship. We're careless in our church, in the churches. We're careless about our Christian walk and careless about the way we carry ourselves and careless about Christian principles and careless about what God says. Oh, we're living in an age where we tell people whatever makes you feel good. If that's your thing, go ahead and do it. We're careless. We're not careful to guard the things of God. Oh, we're going after the world. But look at how these men did. They brought it into the house of the Lord, the house of the Binabab, and they gave Eliezer the duty guard the presence of God keep the place clean keep a watch over the things of God oh I wish we had some Christians that would guard the things of God ah the things that we believe in we let them go loosely put us in the midst of the crowd and we change our theology put us on the job and we switch our mind put us in another environment and we don't know what we believe oh but I wish we had some Eliezer's you don't have a license but you're an Eliezer ain't got no pulpit but you're an Eliezer ain't got no church but you're an Eliezer you take a stand for holiness you take a stand for righteousness come on and let me hear you say glory guarding the presence as Jude said, let us contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. The Bible said that while they were guarding the presence of the Lord, it's just some interesting things that you should check out. It stayed in Abinadab's house for 20 years. Some scholars say it was longer than that. 20 years it stayed. No one went in. It was not moved into the Holy of Holies. Even Samuel did not even go in and perform any sacrifices. 20 years they went to their altars without the presence. 20 years they worshipped Balaam and didn't miss the presence. <laughs> 20 years they carried on their duties. Mrs. Hebrew kept on cooking her lamb stew. Mr. Hebrew kept on plowing the ground and didn't miss God. 20 years they walked around and did their offerings and didn't miss the presence of God until it took a man like Samuel to wake up one day and sound the alarm oh he's going to take the preacher the preacher the preacher oh not the preacher that's preaching for profit not the preacher that's preaching for fame uh, but the preacher who loves God the preacher who believes uh, that this Christian walk is right uh, and that God is God and that the way of Christianity is the only way uh, and that the gospel must be preached far and near oh it takes the preacher who believes in what he preaches it takes the preacher who lives what he preaches to rise up and ask somebody don't you miss God don't you miss his presence don't you need his anointing don't you want his touch don't you want his healing oh come on and put your hands together I need somebody to praise him This nation is in trouble. And I'm not expecting Clinton and all these other people to bring this nation to its knees. Even Clinton is asking us to live right. <laughs> he knows that if the church ever rises up and do it like God says, this nation will be saved. He knows if the preacher keeps on preaching. And if the people keeps on living, oh, that the crime rate will drop. Oh, he knows that the drug man will have to come out of your community. The problem is we are doing church. We are building church. We are having ministries. We have multi-million dollar ministries. But the people's hearts are not soft towards God. They don't want God. I'm not here to teach you how to get a Cadillac. No, I'm not. I'd rather you take the bus and live holy than to get a Cadillac and go to hell. Here is a pre- 
preacher that stood up in the midst of crisis. Thank you. Here is a preacher that saw his nation deteriorate spiritually. Here is a prophet, a true prophet, that put his finger on the pulse of the need. Here is a prophet that wasn't coming with a new attractive message, but he knew that there was a mess in the nation. And the only way to clean up a clean up a mess is to preach truth. The only way to turn something around is to tell what God says. The only way to do it is to tell it even if you don't like it. Ah, to tell the truth because the Bible said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Come on, brother preacher, what is your message? Come on, brother preacher, what is your message? Repent, repent, repent. Repent! Repent! Hallelujah! Oh, come on, McCullough. Do not come to Azusa and pour any rain on our party. <laughs> oh, come on, McCullough. I came here to have a good time and to forget about my trouble. Oh, but maybe you shouldn't have asked me to come because I did come to rain on your party. The Bible says that Samuel had a word. He had a word. He had a word. He had a word for a beaten nation. And what is the word to this ungodly nation? This unrighteous nation? This racist nation? This nation that takes and never gives? Uh, a nation that hates and kills? Uh, what is the word? Repent, 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 repent. Repent, 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 repent. Repent, 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 repent. Oh, come on and put your hands together. The devil hates it. But we're going to run him out of here tonight. Come on and know so to my we are never shut up a higher. Come on and say hallelujah, hallelujah. This message, this message talked about the heart. The heart. The heart. The heart. We have taught you how to dress well. Perry Ellis. All of the other designers are all over the place in here tonight. If I collected all of the designer money, I could go home and be a multi-millionaire. We have taught you how to talk well. We have taught you how to be chic and high tech. And we have taught you how to be prosperous. But we have not taught you how to deal with your heart. <laughs> Ah, we have taught you how to play the game, to do the jerk and to sing the song. But we haven't taught you how to get down in here and bring up some stuff out of here. Ah, we have left out your heart. The Bible said you can't trust this heart, honey. It's desperately. Oh, come on, you don't want to hear it, but it's desperately. It's outrageously wicked. Who can know it but God? It's deceitful. It lies. It pretends. It plays the game. It covers. And only God can give you a clean heart. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. And renew the right spirit within me. We have left that out of our messages. Because that's not popular now. That's right. And ain't going to make you shout. Yeah. Not going to run down to the aisle and make me feel like I've done something good. Ah, but I'm here to tell you that we have done you a disservice. And I'm going to apologize for those who even don't want me to apologize. We have not taught you how to present your heart to the Lord. We have not taught you how to yield that wicked heart. Ah, that rebellious heart. That struggling heart. That hypocritical heart. 
that prejudice heart, that hateful heart, that hostile heart, that angry heart, that heart that is like a stone and only God can make it a flesh. We have not taught you how. For you see, religion is only to make you blessed. Not fulfilled, but blessed. Not whole, but blessed. Not honest, but blessed. Not loving, but blessed. Not righteous, but blessed. Not godly, but blessed. Oh, all I want you to do is to be blessed. And I've made you a, a, a good looking, blessed looking person. And your heart is in trouble. Why do you think we have so much mess in the church? The heart, honey. Why do you think we have so much stick in the church? The heart. Why do you think the church are splitting? The heart. Why do you think folk are sitting up in here tonight and can't hardly raise their hand and worship God? Your heart, your heart, your heart. Oh, but God sent you in here to do something with your heart. If you want him to touch your heart, lift your hands and let me hear you praise him. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. The Bible says that this man preached a three-point message. And he first, he's going to tell you how to get your heart right with God. The same message that they used to preach under the tents in the sawdust. The same old simple gospel that we laughed at and call ignorant. But those folks came out of those experiences with a Christian life and Christian character. Look at your grandmother, look at your grandfather. They didn't have all the things that you have, but they were godly people. Ah, look at your history, look at your history. They didn't have all the fineries, but they were honest people of integrity. Today we can't hardly take people's word in the church. We got the money and we have the clothes, but we don't have any integrity. Oh, God said, give me your heart, give me your heart, give me your heart. Oh, come on and put your hands together. Oh, give me your heart. The nation was in trouble because spiritually they had lost it. And when you lose it, as a church, the world messes with you. The world comes right in the church and takes our best musicians right. while we shouting and speaking in tongues. The world comes in the church and split our churches. The world comes in the church and breaks up the minister's homes. Something is wrong here. The world rather respects Farrakhan and 10,000 men meeting in a, in a hall than respect 12,000 of us in here waving with hats on. Something is wrong. Something is wrong because they don't see something. They don't see something. You see, it's what they see that will make them fear. And when they see Christians standing up on a firm foundation, whether you are from America or from Africa, but taking a stand for righteousness and living it in the morning and living it in the noonday and living it in the kitchen and living it in the living room and living it in the garage, then they will fear you. Then they'll know that you've got a bunch of folk that will praise him in here and go out there and live it. A bunch of people that believe in who God is and will stand on it. They're not impressed with large crowds and large meetings. The only thing that impresses the world is a Christian who has the courage to live by the principles of the Bible and to be Christ-like in his or her character. The Bible said Samuel preached. <laughs> what did you preach, Samuel? Uh, I want to deal with the heart. The heart is the inner self that thinks and feels and decides. In the Bible, the word heart is used interchangeably with the mind. So it's not just what you feel, it's also what you think. It is a place of your emotions. You can express love and hate, Psalm 105 and 15. Joy and sorrow, Ecclesiastes 2 and 10. Peace and bitterness, Colossians 3, 15. Courage and fear, Amos 2, 16. It's the thinking process of man. It is where man carries out the intentions of his heart. It is a place 
where you understand, imagine, remember, be wise. It's a place where you speak to yourself and you make your decisions. It is a place where the heart, it, it heart depicts true character, your personality, purity or evil. Jeremiah 3, 17, sincerity or hardness. Exodus 41, 21, ah, maturity or rebelliousness. Psalm 101 and 2. Ah, so this man knew that if he got to the heart of the people, he would get to the heart of the nation. And if the heart of the nation is touched, if the mind is changed, if God could change your mind, he's got your heart, your body, your finger, he's got your house, your car, your kitchen. If he can get in here, everything would be all right. The problem is he's in here and he's in here. But he's not down in here. So here is a preacher with a strategy. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. The strategy is not feeding another homeless. You feed him and he walks back out in sin and does what he wants to do. The strategy is not putting a man, a suit on the man from the ghetto. Because he'll go right back in the ghetto with the suit on and get drunk. <laughs> oh, but the strategy is to change his heart. If any man be in Christ, oh, I need some help in here. He's a new creature. All things are passed away. Oh, come on church and behold, 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 behold. All things become new. If the heart is changed, his life is changed. So it's not just the emotions, it's not just the feeling, it's the decision making. It's a place where we either say yes or no. It's a place where we either yield or rebel. It's a place where we either walk right or we don't walk right. It's the mind, the mind. And so here is how Samuel attacked, got to the heart of the people. You're in trouble. The flesh is getting ready to kill you. You're in trouble. The Philistines are coming. How do we come back to God? How, we, how do we get our homes back in line? How do we get our church back in line? Hear me, preachers. Not another program, but God wants the heart. Ah, we spend millions on programs and the hearts are still messed up. Ah, we take them from one land to the other and they still come back and go back to the mess. Something is wrong. They hear a thousand messages and still can't get it together. Something ain't clicking. Something is wrong here. We need to come back and turn it over. Just turn over the heart to the Lord. Say, Lord, nothing in my hands I bring but simply to the cross. The Bible says, here is a three-point message. A, a national reformation. We need a great church reformation. We need to go through our churches with a fine-tooth comb. We need to go back and go through the choir with a fine-tooth comb. Preachers, you need to walk up and down your usher board and clean up that mess. Oh, come on here. I hear the Lord saying, go to the trustee board and handle the money. Clean it up, clean it up, clean it up. Oh, y'all ain't going to help me, but I'm going to help myself. Clean it up. Hey, God, clean it up, clean it up. Tell somebody, clean it up, clean it up. Clean it up. Oh, I don't care where the mess is, clean it up. God said, clean it up. Oh, come on and put your hands together. I need a praise in here. Ah, you more shut up. Oh, come on. Help me, help me, help me, help me. I feel the presence of the Lord shuffle. Hallelujah. Here is the first point of this revival message. This message of reformation. This message that will bring the nation security. This message that will keep the enemy from devouring the land. This message that will keep the enemy from eating up your house. Breaking up your marriage. Messing up your church. What is the first part of the message? Repent, repent, repent. Ah, if ye do return. Got to go back. Tell somebody, take me back. Ah, come on, take me back to the place where I first met him. 
Ah, oh, repentance, repentance, repentance. It literally means to break, to circumcise, to convert. Repentance is a three part. You must acknowledge. And ladies and gentlemen, sadly to say that even when preachers preach against sin, it has become a joke. The moment you begin to deal with certain things, check out the Denny's table and the McDonald's table and they'll tell you, oh, the reason why she's preaching about that is because that's her problem. She probably has that in her own struggle. And that's why she's on it. So we even mock the message because we don't intend to repent. <laughs> ah, but you've got to acknowledge Oh, we're in trouble with our hearts because we will not acknowledge, 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 acknowledge. The most dangerous person is a person who will not say that I am wrong. Uh, the reason why there is no change because we will not acknowledge. Oh, don't hurt them, honey. Don't be so hard. Oh, you know this paper doll psychology. Oh, oh, oh you, 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 you'll upset them and, 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 and you'll bruise them. And, and if you confront them, they'll fall apart. It's a lie from the pit. Repent. Ah, oh, you got to change your ways. Repent. You're wrong. Repent. Ah, oh, the Bible said, if any man say that they have no sin, that they are a liar. But if you sin, you can come back because you have an advocate. Ah, oh, if you confess your sins, it means you got to agree. I'm dead wrong. Here I come, Lord. I'm dead wrong. Ah, oh, God, I'm sorry. It ain't my mama and it ain't my daddy. It's me. Oh, yes, it is. It's me. In order for you to have change, you must have acknowledgement. I must be big enough, honest enough. When I want change, I will acknowledge. It means you're aware. Psalm 51 and 3, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Jeremiah 14 and 20, we acknowledge, O Lord, our wickedness and the iniquity of our fathers, for we have sinned against thee. 1 John 1 and 9, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins. Ah, uh, if, 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 the preposition, if, 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 if you stop lying, if, 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 if you want to do better, if, if, if you, if, if you want to stop the mess, if, 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 you're tired of your own self, if, 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 you want to get right with God, if you do it, I am faithful and I am just not to placate you. Not to relieve you. Not to give you something to get over the moment. But I will loose you. Oh, we don't preach that anymore. We preach that God takes you over and takes you over the hump. But we don't believe that God delivers you. Oh, to the utmost, Jesus saves. He delivers, he delivers, he delivers. He delivers, he delivers, he delivers. We have a man tonight who used to take drugs and he's delivered, he's delivered, he's delivered. His mama used to be a spiritualist. She is delivered, she is delivered, she is delivered. This thing works. You can be free if you confess. The devil is a liar. You don't have to stay in sin if you confess. This cheap, weak Christianity. This little escapism that we preach. Tell it like it is God. I love doing it. I did it because I wanted to. I got pleasure out of it. It made me feel good. When I did it, I got a thrill. But God, down in my heart, I love you more than I love my thrill. If you can... Oh, y'all ain't gonna help me in here. Ain't nobody mad but the devil. It's all right. Come on and put your hands together. And... Ah, the ah, I feel like praising him right now. Come on and put your hands together. Oh, come on and praise him. Ah, The 
the next aspect of repentance is that you must express some emotion. I must be sorry. We have raised a whole generation who have not tapped into their own emotions. We have taught them to have things. That's why they'll kill you for a gold chain. And they'll stab their grandmother for her welfare check. And then sit up in the courtroom without any emotions while they're being sentenced to life imprisonment with a face, a face of stone. And we ask what monsters, we created those monsters. Because we taught them that Gucci and gold chain was more important than the heart. <laughs> Here we have this man saying you must repent. So you must be in touch with your own emotions. You must be able to feel the pain and the pinch of your wrongdoings. It is healthy. The moment you lose that, we know you're in trouble. When you stop crying and asking God to forgive you, we know you're in trouble. When you don't cry no more, we know you in trouble. When you can't feel that you've done something wrong and you don't even look sad, we know you in trouble. And we keep doing it and doing it and come back and feel nothing. You got to feel the pinch. Ah, oh, David said, I hate the sin that makes me moan. Ah, oh, you got to know that guilt is not always negative. Guilt forces you to change. When I feel guilty, I want to get it off my back. So I change my attitude. Today we tell you, don't make them feel guilty. Don't put that burden on them. You ought to feel it. The reason why our children can keep on killing and keep on hurting is because we don't let them feel the pain of offending. When you steal somebody's car, you ought to feel sorry. When you hit somebody, you ought to feel sorry. The day you don't feel anything, you have become a monster. And our hearts have become hard. Oh, we have become, we have not felt the pain of our sin. For we have made it easy for you to come and jump and shout and look prosperous. And ignore. You got to cry sometime. You got to feel guilty sometime. Not every guilt should be shouted over. There's some guilt that must force you to action. Not every guilt you cry and get a little touch over. There's some guilt you got to live with all night long. Maybe if you live with it long enough, you'll quit it. <laughs> ah, help me, Holy Ghost. I know I'm by myself tonight. Hey! Oh, come on and praise him just a little bit. Come on. For godly sorrow worketh repentance. For I will declare my iniquity. I will be sorry for my sin. Psalm 38, 18. And then after you acknowledge and after you work it through your emotions, that means you've got to live with some of these things. You've got to analyze it. Don't try to put a band-aid over it. Don't try to dress over it. Don't try to marry over it. <laughs> uh, don't try to get a new house over it. Don't try to get a new hairdo over it. Keep the same hairdo and change it. Then you've got to change. After you feel bad, then don't stay down there. Get up and change. The Holy Ghost is not going to do it. You've got to get up and change. Oh, I know we tell you that the Holy Ghost is going to come by and he's going to come. No, 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 no. That's why many of us still don't change. You've got to get up. Put one foot in front of the other and say, I'm not going over there anymore. Say, if I keep going over there, I'm going to do the same thing. So I'm going to go straight there. Ain't nobody going to help you to do it. You get up and do it yourself. 
we have preached this mystical gospel where we think an angel is going to come down and put a thing through our nose and lead us to righteousness. No, honey, you got to want to live right. You got to get up and do right. You got to get up and walk right. Change your mind. Change your mind. Change your own mind. And how do you do that? By thinking differently. By doing things differently. If you know that certain things are not right and you are sorry and you repent, then you change. The only way we get God to respond to us is if there is a change in behavior. Not just crying. We have learned the art of crying. Repentance doesn't mean just tears. It means after you cry, you get up and change. Oh, let me pop your balloon tonight. This is not coming in here and looking sorry. You got to get up and do it differently. You got to go home and do it differently. You got to go home and do what God said. Uh, whether you like it or not, whether it feels good or not, because you love God, because you want God, because you want to follow God, you got to make yourself. You got to bring yourself under subjection and do what God said. King David had his mess with Bathsheba, but he changed his mind. We're not saying that you will not mess up, but we're saying change because if my people, which are called by my name, and here's the key, would humble themselves. Get that flesh out the air, bring it down, come on. Get your little cutie self out there, bring it down, come on. Get your offensive self up there, bring it down. Get your wonderful self from up there, bring it down, humble it, humble it. Um, get your super intellectual self out of there come on down humble it humble it humble it ah get your amazing anointed ministerial ecclesiastical self up there humble it humble it humble it humble it humble it or oh, tell somebody humble it honey humble it ah come on and put your hands together I need a little help back here hey hallelujah And pray and then turn did you hear what I said I said turn from your wicked ways then will I hear from him there's no negotiation here you got to do it that way there's no compromising or half stepping then and only then will there be a national healing hallelujah to Jesus then and only then will be a national change then and only then the heathen will have to be have will be forced to respect the church. Yes. Then and only then they'll hear the voice of the preacher. Then and only then they'll come to our services and power our altars. Then will I hear from? I will forgive their sins and I'll heal their land. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. It ain't going to take much. I know the suit is $500, but kneel it down. Humble yourself. I know you don't want anybody to see you getting down there, but every now and then we feel like we ought to prostrate ourselves. Every now and then you ought to come out of your high seat and just stretch out before God and humble yourself. Oh, every now and then you ought to stop being so wonderful. Every strand in place. Uh, the tie so perfectly. Come on, cutie, you in trouble. Humble yourself. Oh, yes. Oh, come on and put your hands together in that trouble. Oh, yalla bo, shakabeski, tu hujkide. Humble yourself. I'm so busy impressing you and you're so busy impressing me. We're forgetting to impress God. The second point of the message, and I'm almost finished. It talks about repentance. Come on, Israel. You want me to deliver you from the Philistines. Come on, Israel. You want God to come by and give you protection. Come on, Israel. You want God to do these wonderful things for you. You got to change. And then the second part is, you must have purity of worship. Come away from your idols. The god Astaroth, or the goddess Astaroth, 
In the Greek, she was called As As Azarti. The Babylonians call her Istar. She was the oldest and most widely distributed of the Semitic deities. And she is the goddess of fertility. I want you to hear me. Look what we're going after. Fertility. Which is another word for prosperity. And sex. That is what America has gone after. The God of money and the God of sex. That is what the church has sold out to. Oh, you all ain't going to help me now, but I tell you. <laughs> oh, yes! We have made it easy. We have made it comfortable so that we don't have to talk about sexual things. We, we, we really must not offend you, you see. And, and because I, I, I want to go home with a good offering, I, I, I'm going to leave it alone. But honey, I ain't worried about no offering today. seduced and fascinated by the worship of the other people who bow down to these goddess and the god of ba this goddess of the god of Balaam who was the supreme male deity of the Phoenician and the Canaanite nations the fertility god he was the one who ruled nature the storm god he controlled it the land, the water, the sun. And because they were excited and seduced in the area where most of us have no control. <laughs> oh God, I'm going to ride it tonight. I'm going to be finished with it. I'm going to ride it. In the area where we just can't help ourselves. In the area where we've developed our own theology to justify our messology. <laughs> Hallelujah! Oh, I'm going to shout in a minute. An area where we have allowed folk to do what they want to do year in and year out. And have not confronted them with the word of God have not dealt with the problem of the heart, have left them tied up and trapped up, made them feel good and come in a service and run out and still go back in the same mess. We have released them to the gods of sex and the gods of money. And here is what the preacher said. You got to come away from your strange gods. You got to give up the thing that makes you feel good. You got to walk away from the thing that will make you take a plane from Acapulco all the way to Switzerland to do your thing and come back home. <laughs> ah, you got to give up the thing that will make you walk away and give up the God that loves you. If you come back and give up your cheapest joy. And let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, this thing about sex is in the mind. You can have sex in your mind and don't do anything yet. Is that what Jesus said? Jesus said adultery starts in the mind. It ain't in the body. By the time it gets to the body, it was already in your mind. You saw it and planned it in your mind. By the time you got in the bed, it's almost over. But it was already in your mind. So something is wrong with the mind. Perversion is in the mind. Homosexuality is a product of the mind. 
Oh, you all don't hear me. 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 Come on and put your hands together if you hear me. It's in the. Samuel is saying, come away from the gods of your mind. Come away from the idols of your imagination. Come away from the idols of the center of your emotions. Got to give them up, got to give them up, got to give them up. Oh, I, I know that we're saying to ourselves, it's easier said than done. Oh, but when you get your, give your mind to the Lord. And when you surrender to God, it's not difficult. The way of the Lord is not hard. Only the way of a transgressor is hard. The way of the Lord is not grievous. When you get to a place in God, you love him more than silver. God, you are more precious than silver. And God, you are more costly than gold. I don't care what you've been through. I don't care what you did when you were on the outside. I don't care who turned you want to what in here or out there I don't care what you experienced last night that you never experienced before I don't care what you blew your mind popped your nose open or almost ran you crazy ah there comes a time there comes a time when you love him more than what you experience there comes a time when you love him more than what you felt God you are more precious than silver God you are more costly than gold God you are more beautiful than diamonds Unless you love him like that, you're in trouble. You better go take that stuff out of your heart and say, God, I've got to love you. I've got to love you with all my heart. The prophets, the prophets spoke intensely against the spirit of idolatry and the spirit of Canaanitish worship because it was so perverted and so seductive that once they started practicing it because the liturgy required sex in their worship experience not only sex but orgies perversion it was a part of the worship experience. And the next aspect was offering up of children as sacrifices. And so you can understand why the prophets preach so adamantly against it. You have gone after these things. You have gone after these things. You have opened yourself to these things. You are experimenting with these things. You are practicing these things. You are locked up in these things. You got your nose hooked in these things. But the Bible said you don't need to go anywhere for a six month therapy. Just quit it. And the way you quit it is by worshiping God alone. Anything that you can't stop doing without an intense struggle, it has become an idol in your life. Anything that has such a grip on you that you can't tell it no when God says loose it. Baby, that's become an idol. We have painted wonderful pictures and said, all you got to do is, hallelujah. This people worship me with their lips. But their hearts are far from me. Give up the idols. Tear down every idol. Cast down every foe. Lord, wash me and I. Hallelujah shall be whiter whiter than snow whiter than snow Lord whiter than snow Lord wash me and I oh bless the name of Jesus shall be whiter whiter than snow we have not taught you how to turn these things over to the Lord in worship we taught you the ecstasy of worship. We taught you the forms of worship. We taught you the names of worship. We have not taught you the submission of the heart in worship. When I raise my hand and say hallelujah, 
I have to make some decisions. Like Isaiah said, woe is me. In all of this ecstasy, woe is me. In all of this majesty, woe is me. In the presence of God, I am undone. It's in that atmosphere while I'm raising my hand, God is digging at something. <laughs> while I'm trying to jerk and shake, he's digging at something. While I got my hands up in the air, he's digging at something. You know you hate that sister. I'm speaking in tongues and praising God. And while I'm praising him, he said, okay, you got to go and say you're sorry. You got to go and say you're sorry. Why are you jumping and shouting? Uh -uh, don't walk over there. Walk there. There she is over there. Why are you worshiping? If that does not happen, you are not worshiping. If your heart isn't changed, you are not worshiping. If your attitude isn't changed, you are not worshiping. If your character is not changed, you are not worshiping. I'm tired of this new vow. High tech. Swinging and moving, singing and chanting, and ain't nobody changing. <laughs> hey, but you got to change. Tell somebody change, change, change. Hey, come on and tell somebody I got to change. I got to change. When I leave here, I got to change. When I when I go back home, I got to change. When I when I get back to my city, I got to change. When I get in my house, I got. To oh, come on and put your hands together. And And then repent, clean up your worship. Make sure that when you're worshiping me, you're concentrating on me, you're loving me, you're adoring me, and you are obeying me. You are obeying me. You are obeying me. This is not just emotions. This is not just emotions. They say all we do is get emotional and run in here and have these good little emotional service and go back hard and live in any kind of way. That is a lie. As of tonight, I have denounced it in the name of the Lord Jesus. That spirit is coming out of here. <laughs> oh, yes, 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 yes. When I put on my clothes, I came after a spirit. A spirit that says we only playing. <laughs> no, we ain't playing, honey. We're going to live this thing. By hook or crook, we're going to live this thing. By hook or crook, the church is going to take a stand for righteousness. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Oh, yes, we are. Oh, yes, we are. We're going to get our acts together. Come on and let me hear you say glory. We're going to worship God. If I'm worshiping the same God and I'm black, and you're worshiping the same God, and you're white, then you cannot think that I'm, because I'm black, that you're superior in intelligence to me. And if I'm worshiping the same God, and I'm black, and you're white, I cannot think that I should treat you any differently, or look down on you, because you're white. Something is wrong with that their worship. Huh? Oh, I might grin, praise the Lord. And just as precious as I could be, you can feel the spirit. Oh, come on here. Let's cut the game and get right with God. Oh, come on here. I ought to be able to grab you. And you ought to be able to grab me. And I ought to feel the brotherly love if we're worshiping the same God. Oh, yes. If I'm worshiping God and I'm serving the Lord and I'm having problems with certain areas of my life and I, I'm having a sexual identity crisis. No, 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 we do have, this is serious. And I keep standing like this in his presence. Either this is magic and ritual or this is reality. We have made it a ritual, but we have not made it a reality. We have made it a game, but we have not made it a reality. 
And ladies and gentlemen, I am declaring war between now and the 21st century. That the Christian church will make a statement that when we serve God, it affects our character. It affects our lifestyle. When a man worships God and serves God, it doesn't mean that it's easy, but he has a mind to do right. It doesn't mean that he does it all the time, but there must be a change inside. Something on the inside, working on the outside, is making a change. And if I know that I'm struggling, if I know that I have certain tendencies, and I stand before the Lord, And I worship the Lord. Don't tell me that God does not speak to that stuff. Don't tell me that in the midnight hour he don't wake me up and tell me I want to deal with it tonight, 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 tonight. Get up out the bed and get on the floor. I'm coming after it. Oh, I hear the Lord say to somebody, I'm coming after it tonight, tonight, tonight. I brought you in here to come after it. Oh, come on and put your hands together. Somebody's going to be delivered. Hallelujah. And when he comes after it, it's in the atmosphere of worship. That he heals, he delivers. He sets free. Gives you a new desire. Affects the mind. And when the mind is changed, then the walk is changed. Oh, come on here now. The mind is changed. The tendencies. The look. Huh? The company. Huh? Come on. The relationships. Oh, y'all ain't gonna hear me. (laughs) Ah, this thing is real. There was a man named Zacchaeus. He had one encounter. When God got through with him, the Bible said he told Jesus, whatever I've taken from the people, I'm going to give it back. There was a man named Matthew who was a tax collector. When Jesus got out of his house, he became a disciple of Jesus Christ. We have preached a weak, watered-down gospel. We have made it easy for you to come in and out of these sacred portals and go back home and live with your weaknesses and cover your mess and make all kinds of justification that's why the church has lost its power and its statement but I'm declaring a war on the devil we're going to be delivered we're going to be healed we're going to go back home as new people we're going to shake off the old and put on the new we're going to make a new change we're going to go back home and change some things some things we got to get rid of some things we got to walk away from but we're going to make the change for we want God to send help in our nation and then finally preparing the heart for the Lord I've got to do something with my own heart I've got to talk to my own heart I've got to be honest with my own heart I've got to check my own heart after you leave this meeting and go back to your hotel rooms you've got to say some things to your heart you've got to tell your heart certain things you think you ought not to think them anymore Certain attitudes you have, you ought not to have them anymore. Certain way of living, you ought not to do it anymore. You got to do it, you got to do it. Obedience to God, Deuteronomy 4 and 9. Seeking after God, Deuteronomy 4, 29. Rending your heart, sometimes you got to cut your heart. Oh, I know you don't like this kind of message because you see, we're not supposed to. We're not supposed to deal with cutting the heart. What is the new covenant? Not the circumcision of the flesh. But the circumcision of the heart. We are not having any circumcisions here as they did in the old covenant. But the circumcision of cutting away. Oh come on your heart ain't all that fine. (laughs) As fine as you think you are there's some things we got to cut out. Every day I got to die, I got to die, I got to die, I got to die, I got to. Every day I got to clean, I got to clean, I got to clean. And we have not insisted on that. We call this a poor man gospel. Keeping you poor and depressed. And what we have done is making you prosperous and evil. (laughs) Oh, somebody help me right now. I feel a shock. 
At least when you were poor, you loved him a little bit. Now you got some money we can't find you. Ah, but prepare your heart. Check your heart. Check it. Check it. Check it. Check it. Check it. Check it. So, Sister McCullough, you got something against money? No, honey. No, no, no. You need money. You need money. You need that house. You need that Jaguar. You need that Mercedes Benz. But check your heart. While you're driving that bad Jaguar, check your heart. Ah, while you're in that bad Mercedes Benz, check it. Ah, check it. 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 Ah, check it. Oh, somebody help me. I feel a praise coming. Oh, come on and put your hands together, your tongue. Ah, come on, Moshe. Hallelujah. Oh, come on and praise him, praise him, praise him. Praise him, praise him. Hallelujah. Rending your heart. Rending your heart. Rending your heart, cutting your heart, putting your heart on the table, getting the Holy Ghost knife, cutting out some anger and some hostility, cutting out the hate and the lies. Ah, sometimes God puts you on the table and opens up your heart and you're scared. God, that could not be me. That is not me. God, I don't feel that way. Oh, yes, you do. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Ah, oh, you just knew how to play the game and cover it. Ah, oh, but you have to say like David, search me, oh God. Oh, come on. Somebody need to tell him, search me. Turn on the searchlight. See if there be any wicked ways. And if you find anything, clean it up, Holy Ghost. Ah, oh, come on and put your hands together. Hallelujah. And after you clean me and search me, then renew me. Renewing of the mind. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the constant speaking, renewing, obedience to the will of God. And after you have done all, you bring into captivity everything that wants to go its own way. Anything that wants to do its thing, you pull it on in. You got to do it yourself. We have taught you that the Holy Ghost will do it. After you feel the presence of God, he gives you the enabling to bring discipline, order to your life, structure to your life. Oh, the Christian life is not just shopping and shouting and eating in Denny's and getting fat and buying a new coat and putting on a new dress and coming in here with a new hairdo and trying to smell good and look good. It means going home and clean up your mess and keeping it in order. Keep it in order. So that the world can see that this is a living, walking, talking religion. And then you see the heart... I know your heart. I get to know you when I see how quick you say you're sorry. I get to know you when I see how willing you are to be honest. I get to know you in worship. When I see the devotion. That's when I get to know you. I know your heart when I see how much you love him and adore him. I get to know you. When I see you struggle to walk away from some things that you want and then come and walk to Jesus, not knowing what you're going to get in return. <laughs> That's when I get to know you. I, I, I get to know you also when I see you seeking and searching, reading the scriptures, applying, fasting and praying. That's when I get to see your heart. And then I get to see who you really are when you serve. You see people's hearts when they serve. Not only should you turn away from perverted worship, but you should also give him undivided service. And ladies and gentlemen, we have to buy service in the church, manipulate you to serve, rub you down to serve, massage you to serve, Pay you until we can't pay you no more. And when the money runs out, you can't serve anymore. <laughs> 
Because we have not taught you that service is a reflection of the heart. When I love him, I serve him. I serve him in the day and I serve him at night. I serve him in the dark and I serve him in the light. I serve him when you know me and I serve him when you act like you don't know me. Ah, because it ain't about you, it's about me and him. Ah, undivided silence. The church is in trouble. The church is in trouble. The church is in trouble. We're in trouble. We're in trouble. We're in trouble. We're not making the impact because we won't repent. We teach people how to how to get over. We don't teach them how to change. We allow folk to mix voodoo, psychic, magic. The God of sex, the God of pornography. We allow that stuff to go rampant in our young people. And then we don't teach people how to prepare their hearts. Private devotions. When I was growing up in the church and I'm finished, I grew up in an era where we had people who invested in us. Today you have to raise yourself. But we had people who invested in us and they taught us as young people, little girl, have you sought the Lord today? Yes, ma'am. What does that mean, little girl? Because you never had a name, you were just only a little girl. Well, ma'am, I prayed. What did you say to the Lord, little girl? And then what did the Lord say to you? If you couldn't answer those questions, then you had to go back. <laughs> and then when they say, when you answered, well, the Lord told me one, so they would ask you then, what do you plan to do about it, little girl? When do you plan to obey him, little girl? Oh, we would get mad and upset, but I'm so glad they called me little girl. They taught me how to prepare my life. To present my life as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Apart from the shout, they taught me how to have a heart that's soft towards God. Brother Keith, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Tried and holy. Pure and holy, tried and true. With thanksgiving. I'll be a living sanctuary. Hallelujah to Jesus. Hallelujah to Jesus. Hallelujah to Jesus. Hallelujah. your prayer come on and stand on your feet try to right and true with thanksgiving oh with thanksgiving with upraised hands come on I'll be sanctuary living sanctuary Oh, come on, it's time for worship. It's time for your heart to get in it. Come on. Come on, let's get your heart in it. Lord, prepare me. Lord, prepare me. I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. Oh, hallelujah. I want to be pure and holy. It's time for... I just want to be a living. I'll be a living 
as I get ready to turn the mic over. This was one of the most difficult messages for me to preach. But you know what? I believe that America will come to its knees when we get there first. I believe that the revival is coming as Sister Adam says, when it starts in us first. I believe the story will be effective when it has changed us first. And we have gotten by and gotten over long enough. We have played the game and created a grand mess with all of the so-called superficial blessings. We still have not received the maximum because the change has not come. But tonight, 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 tonight. I want you to start dealing with your heart. Start dealing with what's going on in the inside. And tell God, prepare me to have a different kind of life. A life that's reflective of Christian principles of godliness, righteousness, holiness. God, we've been sloppy, but take the sloppiness out of my heart. God, we've been messy, but take the messiness out of my heart. I don't want to be churchy. I don't want to know how to move and jerk. I want to know how to live. Hallelujah. I just don't want to be famous. I don't want to be a star. I want to be a Christian. I want to be a Christian. I want to be a Christian. God, if I don't have another preacher engagement, I want to be a Christian. If I, I, if I never get my name on a magazine cover, I want to be a Christian. I want this thing to be real in me. Go home and have a Christian marriage. Hallelujah. Raise Christian children. Do what's right with my money that's pleasing to God. Change my community. But it has to start pure and holy. No compromise here. Pure and holy. Tried and true. Hallelujah to Jesus. With thanksgiving. With thanksgiving, I want to be. I want to be, be a living sanctuary. 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 For you. I want you to find a partner, turn around and face your partner. The heart is the most delicate yet most dangerous, powerful organ, the mind. And we'd rather deal with the outside than deal with the heart. But I want you to get a partner tonight and start dealing with the heart. I'm not asking you to confess. What I'm asking you to do is look your partner in the eye and begin to say, I want God to, to deal with your heart. I want God to search your heart. Heal your heart. Cleanse your heart. Renew your heart. But there's some things you must do. You must change. Some things you got to change. Tonight you have to start changing. Your worship, your worship. Make sure that you're worshiping with all your heart, all your mind, and all your strength. Make sure that you spend time with him. 
seeking him, loving him, reading his word, fasting, praying, obeying him, listening for his instructions. And then make sure that you serve him. Your time, your talents, your skills, your resources. That's where the heart is. If you don't do it like this, you're going to have trouble with your heart. Lord, prepare me to be this sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving. From this night on, I'll be a living sanctuary just for you. Come on and tell him thank you. Come on and praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, come on and praise. Oh, come on and praise. Come on and praise. Come on and lift your voices and praise him. Come on and praise him. It's time to praise him. With your heart. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, lift your voices, lift your voices. Out of your spirit, out of your mind. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Come on, the heart got to come through tonight. You got to release your heart in here. Come on. Come on, open your mouth and praise it. Praise it, praise it, praise it. Hallelujah. I want you to, before I turn it over to Pastor Pearson, I want you to really praise God because God dealt with many of our hearts tonight. God got down in silence. Oh, yes, he did. Oh, yes, he did. Many of us are going home with a new heart tonight. Oh, come on, let the devil hear you praise him. Ah. Oh, you need to praise him. Something has happened. Hallelujah. Oh, come on. Praise him. Praise him. Our hearts have been turned. Hallelujah. Oh, come on and praise him. Your heart. Oh. Hallelujah to Jesus. And you see, you know when your mind has changed, when your actions have changed. So some of you are going home and you can't do certain things the way you used to do it anymore. You're not going to act the way you used to act. This is not magic. It is obedience to the word of God. And God touch your hearts tonight. This is what America needs. A change of heart. A change of mind. A change of living. A change of attitude. And you can tell them it started at the Zuzah 94. The change started in here tonight. There's a change that went out in the atmosphere. The spirit of change. Oh, come on, I want you to praise him. There's a spirit of change that's been released. Hallelujah. Oh, open your mouth and praise him for the change. Hallelujah to Jesus. Glory to God, glory to God. Amen. When we change and our attitudes are changed, then unrighteousness cannot reign. Sin cannot have preeminence. Crime cannot take control. Drugs cannot run the streets. But it's got to start in here. And if somebody will just praise him one more time, we'll release some more things. Oh, come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The chain. This is for the change. This is for the change. Hallelujah. Praise the God. Praise the God. Praise the God. Praise the God. Why you're praising God? It could be that somebody is getting saved at home. 
Now, now I, I know that some of you don't believe it, but, but, but let me give, let me give my mother's testimony. My mother is here tonight. She's been saved for 57 years. And she and my father were going out together. And one night somebody took her to a Pentecostal church. Foot stomping, hand clapping, tongue talking, Pentecostal church. She got down at the altar and the lady asked her, what do you want? She said, I want to be saved. She said, but there's something in your heart that you're holding back. She said, yes, there's a man that I'm about to marry. And, and I feel like if I don't release him, I can't get what I want. The lady said, give him up. And my mother said, I'm going to give him up now. While my mother was giving him up at the altar, God was getting him in the house. Oh, yes. When my mother got home, my father was messed up on the floor. Sloppy messed up. The Holy Ghost went all the way in the house. Knocked him out the bed. Turned him upside down. And they've been saved for 57 years. Maybe if you praise him, he'll turn some things for you. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, bless God. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Once we change our minds, God will hear from heaven and he'll heal the land. I don't know about you, but there's some things you need healing from. And if you know that your heart has been changed, you need to, some of you start to walk the aisles. We need to walk the aisles and praise him. And I hear the Lord say, while you're praising him, I'm healing some things and I'm changing some things. Some of you need to come out of your seats and just begin to praise him. It's healing time. God said, I'm going to heal. If you change, I'll heal. If you change, I'll heal. If you praise me, I'll heal. Oh, come on and praise him. Come on and worship him. Come on and give him the glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah to Jesus. Lord, I heard your word. I'm going to obey your word. God, I heard your word. I'm going to obey your word. God, I heard your word. I'm going to obey your word. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. 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 Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 We need a change in the land. Hallelujah. Lord, I'm going to obey you and you change it. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to change my attitude. As I do it, you'll do the change. Hallelujah. My mind is changed. If my mind is changed, then you'll do some things for me. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah to Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to you. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you. As I go back to my seat, I want you to turn around and tell somebody, this is not magic. This is obedience to the word of God. Come on, tell yourself, this is not magic. This is obedience to the word of God. This is not magic. This is obedience to the word of God. Oh, come on and lift your hand and say, glory.
Listen. Wait, 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 wait. Not time to shout yet. Shh. Change. Change. Don't shout. Change. Wrap your arms around yourself. Just a minute. We're going to let you go. The holiness of God finds its most articulate expression in the condemnation of sin. Not sinners, sin. The woman of God did not preach about cars and homes and clothes. The word of the Lord was to the heart. Don't miss it. Sin is first pleasing. Then it's easy. Then it's delightful. Then it's frequent. Then it becomes habitual. Then you become obstinate. Impenitent. Resolved never to repent. And then you're ruined. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. Remember that old song? Oh, oh, there's a great change in me. A great change in me. I am so happy. I am so happy. And I am so free. Jesus brought me out of darkness. Gave me liberty. Oh. A great change. There's a young American who is being possibly tomorrow struck six times with a, a cane that's been soaked in water. And all of America's in an upheaval. And his mama's crying all over the news. But if she had to use the cane at home and made him respect authority. Some martial arts expert wouldn't have to do it now. Are you listening to me? That is a sign in the natural. If we don't submit to the discipline of the Lord, God's going to let somebody else take a cane to us. Are you listening to me? So please receive this in your soul, in your spirit. And say this, Jesus, forgive me. I change my mind. I repent. I I rethink. Yes, I reverse. Sanctify me. By thy word. For thy word is truth. And deliver me now. From every lying spirit. Father. I submit to you. And recommit to you. My whole soul mind and body from this night forward I'll never be the same deliverance and victory over myself and over my sin and over all sickness and ultimate victory over death in the name of Jesus now tell him yeah And tell him, yeah, come on, yeah, oh yeah, say it again, yeah, come on, come on, come on, yeah. Yeah.
yourself and say, I am delivered. Come on, say it again. I am delivered. And the devil is under my feet. Oh, there's a great change in me. There's a great change in me. I am so happy. Come on. I am so free. Jesus brought me out of darkness into his marvelous light. Into his marvelous light. And oh, 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 there's a great change. Tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, then again at 10. Tomorrow morning, prayer. Dad Vaughn, Mother Campbell, Edwin Cole at 10 o'clock. Tomorrow night, Kenneth Copeland, Helen Baylor, and others. Forgiveness of sins, the benediction of the Lord be upon you all. Turn to somebody and say, I needed this tonight. Here's the last thing. Gary McIntosh, come and give us the benediction. This man was my associate in my church for 12 years. He's now traveling, itinerating, evangelizing. In fact, his brother Ron is also, his parents are the, old, are the longest partners I have. They have stood with me from the beginning since we were roommates in college. And Ron, they're both, both their sons are saved. They're traveling and preaching and ministering and getting folks delivered. Bless you, Brother Good. Happy birthday yesterday. 47 years old. No, 41. We stand at Gilgal. Gilgal means the wheel. We've been praying for a move of God and we missed the move of God. The move of God is within us. There is the greatest move we have ever seen. It is now among us and it, 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 it is in us. We're at Gilgal. The wheel is turning. The move is on. Father, we pray tonight. For the obedience of your spirit to be upon us. For the anointing of the Holy Ghost to give us the will to say yes to everything you're doing and saying in us. That in the days to come, you'll do mighty things through us. We thank you for this intimate time this night. And we treasure it in the Holy Ghost. We leave pondering it, saying yes to your spirit for everything that you shall do. We give you the praise. Thank you for this night. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Serve the Lord in Jesus' name. Now don't wait till the battle is over. Shout.